All right. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, there's a couple people I don't know yet. So, welcome. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director at All Brains Belong. And this is Brain Club. I'm going to share screen and get us oriented. There we go. So, Brain Club, our weekly community conversation about everyday brain life. This is an education space that we created in January of 2022. I believe it's been so long, um, you know, for the for the broader ABB community for purposes of educating the community about neurodiversity. Um, you know, uh, this this what it just it, sometimes it helps as by way of a shared community agreement just to, to, to name what this is not and why. So um, uh, we have lots of different programs here. Uh, we do have um, medical programs and we do have peer support programs, but uh, this is not one of those programs. This is an education space. And why is because um, some of, uh, so, so some of you have those other kinds of relationships with us, but many of you don't. And we want to make sure that, um, uh, that, that that if folks are in a space of processing individual situations or individual trauma, it can be a thing that if you start processing that and don't get to finish and you don't have support afterwards, that actually can be harmful, which is why we really delineate Brain Club as an education space. All forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off. Many of you have figured that out already. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You certainly don't need to sit still or look at the camera or anything. You know, feel free to fidget and stim and eat and take breaks and all the things. And everybody's welcome here. Um, and all formats of communication are okay. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. Um, and, you know, given the size size of Brain Club, to kind of depending, um, you know, I uh, sometimes I can read everything from the chat. Sometimes I can just keep up with selections, um, but we often have a, a robust chat box going throughout. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, particularly as the size of Brain Club has grown, um, we think it's really important to protect the group's collective access needs with very specific communication ground rules. So how we respect and protect group access needs is with respectful language, um, particularly because a lot of folks are participating with video off, there may be little ears listening nearby, so just be aware of that in terms of the language that you're choosing and the topics that you're discussing. And we want to give space for all participants to participate. Uh, observation is a completely valid form of participation. And if you would like to participate, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, directly, um, we want to make sure that you have space to do that. So if um, you know, when, when we get to the point of group discussion after our panel, um, just just uh, you know, if you've shared, if you shared out loud, make um, just just be aware of giving space for other participants to have a, a chance. All right. Last bit of access, closed captioning. It is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you can look for either the live transcript closed captioning icon. And if you don't see that, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. Get you do the same thing to choose hide subtitle to turn it off. And um, mentioned the chat before, that's the chat box window. Um, and that's how you can find it. So um, we are continuing our June 2023 theme of neurodivergent health. Um, we started to discuss healthcare experiences last week, um, and we're going to do a recap for those who, who, who missed it. So recap, the status quo of neurodivergent health is not good, not good at all. Um, and we talked about how um, there are extensive barriers to healthcare access for neurodivergent folks, clustering um, in these three buckets, the environment or healthcare interactions, um, issues with the provider, um, patients perceive that provi uh, providers have insufficient knowledge and skills and unhelpful attitudes to provide care. These are, these, this is a study of autistic adults in primary care, um, and barriers within the system and the defaults of the healthcare system. We also talked about how healthcare providers, unfortunately, still in 2023, don't get a lot of training in autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dyslexia, 
Um, and we talked about how in the example of autistic adults, um, when primary care clinicians are only trained in stereotypes, not surprisingly, folks go unnoticed. And this gap between um, someone's experience and having a narrative to explain it um, gets wider and wider as time goes by. We also talked about how uh, medical providers um, don't get training in the particular physical health experiences of autistic and ADHD people, that there is a cluster of neuroimmune conditions um, that involves the entire body. And so in a world where, unfortunately, healthcare is often so fragmented into body parts, often um, we're not zoomed out enough. It's like Google Maps. When you're so zoomed in, you don't know what continent you're on. And many people have this pattern of neuroimmune conditions that goes unrecognized often for decades. Hey, Lizzie, can you pop in the chat um, the link to our Instagram post on the, the uh, on, on the All the Things project and maybe also the, the link to our website, the, the specific All the Things website with the video and stuff? Okay. Just for, for folks who want background, background, um, because the idea is that this is contributing to a lot of unmet healthcare needs. Last part of recap is we talked about the double empathy problem, where it's not that, and, and by the way, that, that term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, an autistic social scientist in the UK, thought, uh, who found in research studies that miscommunication happens when there is a mismatch between autistic and non-autistic people. That it's not that there's one set of normal social communication skills and then everyone else. It's that it's when there's a mismatch between worldview and communication style is breakdown. So we tried to bridge the double empathy problem between patients and healthcare providers last week. Um, so so we had a, a, a it was it was our medical Providers here at All Brains Belong, uh, myself, Sierra Millard, Dr. Gabe Borzella, and um, we had a discussion about what our training was like and uh, our own journey of unlearning. So, so if you missed that last week, um, we can we'll, we can we can link to that in the in the chat also. Because today it's time for part two. Part two um, is patient stories, the patient experience of being a neurodivergent person accessing healthcare. So before we, uh, we, we play our pre-recorded video, um, which it will run about 25 minutes and we'll have the chat going um, while the video plays and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So uh, just wanted to first off thank our community panels. These are five members of our community advisory board, um, Sarah Knutson, Matthew LaFleur, Amy Noyes, Linda Riddle, and Zeph. Thank you all so much. And uh, many, of, many of you are here tonight. Um, so, so with that, David, take it away. When you think about your experiences trying to access healthcare, what comes to mind? It's very hard to access health, healthcare. I think it's hard in general, I think our system is broken um, for pretty much everyone. But the amount of additional layers that come when you have, you know, and, and in a way, any type of disability, just it, it makes it truly a monumental problem. It's when you think about your experience trying to access healthcare, what comes to mind? Um, this is gonna be kind of a bummer of a conversation. So here's a content warning because I don't have a whole lot of really great healthcare experiences. I have medical PTSD. So when I think of the healthcare experiences that I've had, a lot of them have been very challenging, particularly from communications perspectives, trying to make myself understood to the doctor and being understood. What comes to mind is 
is a doctor or a physician or the nurse, you know, uh, willing to uh, understand that this individual is different than all the others and how can he or she adapt to that individual needs. But with me, it's more about, you know, will this doctor, nurse, physician accept me for who I am, not what I am? obviously been autistic my whole life but I didn't know I was autistic so I didn't ever knew what the challenge was and I think about myself even as like a little child and someone had to put attention on me or um, had to touch me in any way um, I think I had a real fear response that I'm just starting to really start recognizing um, and I didn't always felt like I was asked permission and that I realize in retrospect is huge. Um, so I kind of didn't access healthcare or access that very, very minimally. Even in emergency rooms, like not being able to tolerate the environment and being, you know, potentially written down as an uncooperative patient because I had to leave before they were done with their stuff because I just couldn't tolerate it. What are some challenges that you faced in accessing healthcare? The challenges that I face accessing healthcare is the accessibility formats, documentations that they give you, new patients or existing patients, you know, forms that you had to fill out per meeting or pre form meetings when you get there for your doctor appointment that day, which is, you know, it's not accessible. It's, it was very anxiety producing for me. Um, the thing I think is like what I've recognized, even in like a basic wellness exam, there wasn't a connection. I didn't have a connection to my body and I didn't have a connection to understanding why the question was being asked. So if I went to a wellness exam and they're like, tell me about your teeth. And I would just be like, I don't know. I don't know how. And I, because I'd be so anxious, I don't think I had access like to my fully functioning, like speaking, um, I just wouldn't know what to say. Nobody believes you. And then there are different levels of that in, you know, well, you look at it wrong or you couldn't possibly know yourself because you're this subgroup or that subgroup. And then there are the ones where, well, they, everybody looks fine. So it has to be fine. And I found out a lot as a parent that I would know something was wrong, but my kids didn't look disabled. Oh, uh -oh. they looked cute and perfect and just the right amount of chubby. But no, no, I'm just one of those moms. Yes, the difficulty healthcare system for me was the physicians of <clears throat> trying to understand my complexity of my learning knowledge and how I learn and how can they adapt to my learning. For me, it's more about, you know, not only speaking to them on that same level, which is very, very tricky, but also complexity of the healthcare system in, in itself because they're running on the medical terminology of, of the healthcare college insight. And when they use those uh, or explain those to patients, sometimes patients like myself with disabilities uh, cannot get it because it's, you know, it's like you're teaching a seminar at a university, but you're doing it with a patient. Well, she has staring spells. Well, she can walk a straight line and touch her nose, so there couldn't possibly be any neurological difficulties. And you know, it's, it's coming from otherwise knowledgeable people. You start to wonder, where is the problem? I have spent a lot of time not getting a lot of things. And part of it was, well, maybe this is just something I'm not, maybe I am wrong. 
you know, maybe there's this big cosmic thing that 95% of the populace gets and I don't get because I'm me and I don't get it. And I didn't know why I didn't get it then, but I just knew I didn't get it. Right. But no, it wasn't me this time. A lot of different symptoms show up in the different systems of the body that were fundamentally neurologically related. Long COVID, you know, and other, you know, uh, medical issues like asthma. Uh, it's, you know, it's very common, but it's also things that should never be ignored in the medical profession field because those could complicate, you know, the lifespan of an autistic adult or child. Even though I talked with them about the other symptoms of the autism, my symptoms were brushed off as PTSD. And I can just feel when I walk in, I don't know if it's a safe space for me. And I know, I don't know that it's like a safe space for me, like uh, being neurodivergent, but I also don't know if it's a safe space because of the way that I'm gonna be treated and, and disregarded in terms of like, just go lose weight. I'm terrified to go. I, I think there's a lot of assumptions being a fat person. And um, so like, if I go get my um, blood pressure checked or something like that, there's this like quality of, oh, I can't believe that you have normal blood pressure. Like the, just like the things that people are saying to me, you know, I just recently had a routine mammogram and like what was said to me during that appointment was incredibly inappropriate. When I came to Vermont and, you know, I moved here, so you had to get a new medical home, this old country doctor, nice man otherwise, took a look at me, weighed me, and signed me up for like the entire list of every health test you could possibly have. And I'm like, I don't really want to pay for all these, but okay. And then I was like, no, we don't need to do the cholesterol. At least I know that one is fine because I'd had it done recently and I inherited low cholesterol from my dad. And he wouldn't believe me. So we ran the test and my cholesterol actually had gone up. It had, and I said, well, should we worry? Because it's gone up six points in a year. That's the most it's ever gone up. And he told me to be quiet. And I was like, okay. And I, I couldn't really voice anything back for me because we're trained not to do that. Well, how is your menstrual cycle? And I was like, fine, great. Well, when was your last cycle or whatever? And it was like, I have no idea. And I immediately like was yelled at. Um, and what they said to me was, uh, it's my, I think of, and I started crying and they said to me that it's my job like, I always think it's a good sign when people are crying because it's my job to make sure. And if I have to yell at people to make sure that they're taking care of their health. Going through that time period was super frustrating, trying to like yeah. get attention and going to like all these different specialists and not getting a whole lot of answers. So many of these experiences are me advocating for what I need, it took me five years to get a diagnosis for my autism. My healthcare provider said, well, we can't say you're autistic or like, you know, like my chiropractic care was like, um, no, there's just no way. Like, just like not asking me, not, not um, curious at all. Like not saying why, what makes you think that you're autistic or how could we find you an autistic specialist to figure out or- To give you some idea how powerful it was, number one, learning that I was, learning that I was autistic was like a kaleidoscope coming into focus for my entire life that made everything make sense. And I was also diabetic at the time. My blood sugars literally dropped 20 points overnight and stayed down with the self-diagnosis of autism. I, I find that hypocrisy bothers me a great deal in general. And, you know, we're supposedly, you know, a society where we're supposed to take care of ourselves and be informed and make decisions and be self-actualized and everything. And even if you're all those things, 
and in many ways, if you are those things, healthcare isn't designed to work for you. You know, it's sort of designed for you show up and they send you places and put you in little cubbies and folders. And if you actually are like, no, uh, this, that, that doesn't actually affect me. This over here affects me. Nobody quite knows what to do with you. Doctors, I don't think are really taught how to work with patients who don't fit the the expectations of you know what the profile is they're trained to make decisions in a very specific way they need to in order to be really good with their time Um, because nobody else lives in your body but you right right so you think after a certain amount of time you would become an expert in it yeah i mean that's kind of how i look at mine Thanks. Knowing that just because somebody shows up in front of you and may appear normalish enough, but there needs to be given some amount of space or grace to allow for the fact that maybe this person has other things going on that you don't know about. I try very hard to communicate, but then when I get frustrated, I become very blunt and the new doctor I have, for, she at least can deal with that. Mm. But a lot of people in healthcare are still sort of trained in that, you know, I am in charge and you are here at my whim sort of thing. And, you know, we must be respectful. There's so many different layers of those nuances that I'm like, no. I had to wait 45 minutes for you. I could never go back. So in that one moment, and I like, I went to therapy and like, we had, we're starting to get all these strategies of how do I go back? And that's when I found ABV. I would really, I would basically, I was going through another round of low mood and, and fatigue and sort of growing hopelessness about the possibility of having a future. And um, I had exhaust, pretty much exhausted mainstream healthcare options, or at least the mainstream healthcare options I was willing to try. Um, mm-hmm. And I uh, heard this, I was sitting with this friend um, with over coffee, who was the director of the Vermont Disability Council. And she was raving about this new doctor in Montpelier who was out as autistic and starting a medical practice. So, um, What do you wish healthcare providers knew about neurodiversity and neurodivergence? It's really like, I want them to know about ABB. I want them to know what Mel has figured out. I want them to know um, this connection between all of the things um, that I wasn't waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. I was waking up because I wasn't breathing because I needed a sleep study. I was waking up because I have dysautonomia because my autonomic nervous system doesn't work correctly. Everyone was putting this on me that like my thoughts were causing these panic attacks. Like, I don't know who has panic attacks. I wasn't having a thought in the middle of the night. And the, the way in which Mel has reframed that it's my fault, that I'm not doing something correctly, that I'm broken, which is, I feel like what the healthcare would say, like, you're not doing enough. And what I hear Mel saying is no, the medical system isn't doing enough for you. And so that's what I would love to say is that if the medical care system didn't blame people who have um, difference, uh, that instead was curious about that. And we have made some, not enough, but some progress over the last 40 years, learning to accept people a little bit, to give people a little bit more grace, a little bit more space to be themselves when we can tell they need it. But if you look like you should fit and then you don't, people get cranky. And if the cranky people are the people that we're relying on to give us the referral, to actually listen, to think about what we're saying and try and put the pieces together, 
in the areas that we aren't knowledge about because nobody can know all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if they're just grumpy because we don't fit what they think, no. For me, I see that, you know, process of the healthcare industry is starting to come around and understand neurodivergent, neurodivergent individuals and neurodiversity. Having curiosity around my experience, like asking me, do I understand where the question is coming from? Providing a space that I can feel comfortable in and safe in, um, helping me make connections back to myself, not making presumptions about my body, but asking me if like that makes sense. Finding ABV is just like, you know, I've said this to Mel, I've said this to a lot of other people, but it's like, I just know I'm going to live longer. I can't imagine being yelled at. I can't imagine like not being cared for. I think the whole first wellness visit that I had with Sierra, I think I bawled the entire, like I just remember like my shirt being all wet because I was just couldn't believe the care that I was getting. And I couldn't believe the, the access and I didn't even know what I needed. I had zero idea and, the, and the, that there was all these different options. And um, so it's just so radically different for me. The idea that we can just say, this is my access need. And if we can take that step to say, okay, we're gonna actually look at this problem. What is the actual problem with access? What is the actual problem with communication? What is the actual problem with coverage? Oh, then maybe we can fix some of this shit. So I think that's what we need. What I want providers to do across Vermont statewide is to understand the individual needs. If we can understand your needs, we need to be res respected in the same way. And for me, it's more about, you know, having that, you know, re having that work individual participant relationship. Basically, you want the doctor to know, get to know you better, vice versa, the patient should get to know the doctor better. That helps move things along quicker and make the process more easy for both parties, the doctor, the nurse, and the physician at large. Mm -hmm. Plus the individual patient would get, would feel at ease, you know, of, you know, coming back to those services. So um, I, I did the intake, which invited me, and, and then um, that invited me to share, like among other things, what I care about. Um, and also, also offered to have a provider spend time discussing things I cared about, which really, Im which really impressed me. And and um, um, among other things, like the like the like the possibility of sort of like how do you structure the, an appointment in a way that it's comfortable to you and you feel comfortable. And I thought, and I you know things I had never thought about is even possibilities of sitting in a doctor's chair, you know, chair with you know, a comfortable blanket or, you know, pillows or, you know, something like that, you know, so that, that was like, oh, I could, you know, and, and so that it was just nice that people thought about things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was sitting, um, when I was sitting in the waiting room for my first appointment, there was this, um, a short, a really short book written for kids. And it basically told my life story of losing it. I mean, I remember reading it, waiting for my first appointment. So it's sort of, losing it and having these public meltdowns that I was so ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And it explained those things in terms of the flight, the fight flight response, which I was totally on board with already. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then there was also something on the wall in the office about polyvagal theory, which I was also totally on board with already and thought, and was impressed that, that ABB knew about mm -hmm. and was thinking about. And I, so at that point I thought, wow, it, it looks like these people speak my language. And what I want to see for it is, you know, that sense of belonging within the healthcare field industry, but also understand everybody's access needs is different. 
we're all different. We're not the same. And uh, for me, it's more about trying to connect, have that universal connection between each industry or each systems and try to make it a collaborative system where it's cost effective and more efficient because everybody wins that way if it's more collective than having these barriers or what you call silos that are preventing us from providing those services in the first place. And then, uh, and then this is like a, a sincere attempt, a really sincere attempt, the most sincerest attempt I've ever seen in a medical practice to meet people where they are at, to serve everybody well and to leave nobody behind. Um, it's, you know, it's an incredible effort to make groups and meetings and medical care accessible and, and interpersonally, practically, financially. Um, there's the, 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 and I love that the practice is, is really developed in consultation with pa patients and like we're in these advisory groups and, and, um, and invited to join them and, 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 the, and, and that, and that, that, that what happens in the practice after that is in, in for, how the practice develops is informed and driven by what we say in those meetings and basically informed and driven by patient needs. I just didn't know um, that I would make it. And so when I say like, I know I'll live a longer life, it's not only do I live a longer life because I have the healthcare, but now I have community, I'm making friends. I feel understood. I feel like um, all of the all of the things that seemed so isolated in the issues with my health are now under, understood with very simple medications. You know, like you know, it's like it just changed my relationship to being able to get up in the morning. It's like like limited my limbic response so that I actually can be here right now speaking to you all of these things that ABB are providing for me. Um, and then it's like the, the other patients are just, I learned so much. This, this is just like so amazing to me. There, there are these amazing group medical visits where um, Mel and Sierra offer this cutting edge information, and, but they, and they also allow lots of time for questions and in-depth discussion around areas, uh, the, the areas that concern us. And there's, and beyond that, you know, and, and, and there's more because there's also an opportunity to meet others in the community who are going through the same or similar things, um, which then gives you know, us the opportunity to learn from each other's experiences and to really value and feel valued by each other and feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful. That was awesome. I really just want to begin with just expressing my really profound gratitude to Amy, Linda, Sarah, Zeph, and Matthew for sharing for sharing so much of your stories and at, at, at including the painfulness of so many of your stories um, because. You're not alone. I mean, as we went, as as we watched here, the the so many people chiming into the chat, sharing their versions of of traumatic memories of of interactions, and I think that um, what I'm also seeing is that at least those who have shared so far today is that right now we have the lens of like, well, that interaction is unhelpful. That interaction is like not a thing that ought to happen. Um, but like in the, in the moment, that is not, that doesn't, it's not always that clear. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that, that, that we hear a lot is when people have these interactions and they it's normalized, right? It's normalized. And if we think back to the conversations of last week around how these things come to be normalized and the 
the system, right? Because it's it's a story of individual interactions, but the context is the system. It's the system that is thwarting the individuals and leads to, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to assume unintentional harm. What's standing out for folks today about this conversation? It almost seems like the believability, you know, the, the doctors realizing that what this patient is really describing is they're really experiencing. And I'm almost wondering, could that be a function of them being burnt out myself? Because I've run into doctors who are burnt out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's like we, like we talked about last week, right? So if you have the system that is, if you as a healthcare provider have the system dysregulating you, thwarting you left and right and placing toxic expectations um, and toxic working, working conditions, um, it, it, it's a recipe. It's a recipe for not having full access to your cortex. And the downstream consequences that is that patients are or dismissed, invalidated, traumatized. I forget who it was that said um, that they were an expert in their own body and how could they somebody not understand that? But it, it, that really resonated with me a lot. And um, it makes sense that like, if you live in your body every day, I, I, it's hard to understand why a doctor wouldn't like understand that. <laughs> Linda said it, okay, thanks. Yeah, and I, I, and I think that intellectually, probably, probably most do understand that. Um, I think that it's the interactions, it's the interactions within the, the context of a dysfunctional system that interfere with that expertise of lived experience being appropriately elevated. Um, and there's you know, a lot of, um, there's a lot of what we call the, like the hidden curriculum in medical education where um, health career trainees are, they're provided a narrative that becomes like part of the culture around like, oh, well, there's a patient with the list. There's the patient printed out the thing from WebMD. Um, and like that, it's, 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 um, It's again, go back to the double empathy problem, because I think that no healthcare provider wants to be invalidating or dismissing. I think it's, I think it's unintentional. I think it's, it's like the, the intersection of trauma, dysregulation and culture, often really quite unhealthy culture. Sierra or Gabe, is there anything you want to say about that? It's okay if not. But go ahead. I, yeah, I think um, I think that um, medical training is very much trained in um, systems and algorithms, and looking for the specific picture that you read in textbooks. Um, and as we know, people's bodies don't follow textbooks and they don't read textbooks. Um, and so if you don't fit that traditional picture of what providers have learned and been tested over and over again about, then um, it can be really hard for providers to be able to see that given their training and given kind of how they're, how we are, um, how, how we're trained. And the the basis on so much of medical care, I think is also algorithm based and providers sometimes have a really hard time kind of straying off of that. Um, understandably, we want to be safe for our patients. I actually found connected to that, that reminds me of something that Zeph said in their comments about um, acknowledging that 
doctors are trained in some of these heuristics, these decision-making heuristics, that's not the word that's used, but the idea of like for efficiency, there are these like rules that allow things to be like eliminated because they're less likely and they're, they're based on neuronormative presentations. There's like a really important piece of physiology missing. I can say, I can only speak for my own self. Um, I had this, um, this injury last year that I was like legitimately worried, like, like more worried than I think, you know, that I had been in, in recent time about what I, what I thought I did. Um, and I actually thought about, I, I thought about seeking healthcare and I tried to avoid it because it's, you know, like we all describe. Anyway, um, when I finally sought healthcare and I described what I was experiencing, my, my, the response was very much like, well, yeah, well, you're a young, healthy person. I'm not, I, I might be a young person, but I have all the things and my blood vessels and my connective tissue are different than the average 40 year old connective tissue. Um, and I, it's just, it, it's not part of training, but so these heuristics, these, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, Steve, Steve's mentioning algorithms as a crutch. It's, 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 um, in addition to that, it's like, you know, the, the, in a world where any one symptom might be attributable to like a gazillion things, there needs to be a, a way of clinical decision making that makes things feel more or less likely. Um, otherwise, it would it really would be chaos. Um, but those heuristics that are taught and practiced um, are incomplete. Just because someone is young doesn't mean that there are things that are you know eliminated. Or just because and now in a you know in in a world where we have so many people who have had COVID who now have. Um, you know, that this as a trigger for stepwise progression of their neuroimmune conditions. We have, we have young people with very, very complex neuroimmune conditions that um, traditional teaching would say would not be what would be expected. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm also going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up um, WCAX came to All Brains Belong and talked about the, uh, covered the, like the health inequity for autistic adults. And um, this, 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 what I just said was, 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 was what I talked about there, which is that like, you know, neurodivergent people present in ways that are not what a medical provider might be expecting. And so it's again, this, you know, you, you, you have this expectation, you look for it when something, I, I think, like Sierra said, when something doesn't match, not just what you learned about from the textbook, but what you think you've seen and rehearsed and over rehearsed, even for, you know, very long careers. I think I like the example that I know you have used before, Mel, of like pain presentation. And a lot of times I know um, when I worked in healthcare, there was a lot of like, oh, somebody reports 10 out of 10 pain, but they have a, but really clinically, they look like they're in less pain or they have a positive cell phone sign where they're using their phone and not acknowledging that some people, especially people with chronic pain, use things as regulation mechanisms and might be on their phone as a form of regulating their pain um, and also might not show pain the same as somebody who doesn't have chronic pain. Um, and that that assumption that uh, it's all everybody's going to present exactly the same way and then you can rely on that to make decisions um yeah yeah one to ten pain scales are um i was just going to add add to that and add to what what mel had said before um and i like how you frame it as conflicting access needs i mean like and then and then throw someone who you know was not trained or taught to really think about speaking for a medical provider think about how um like dysregulating stress can be and how that can change how you interact socially and professionally and if you're like mel 
was saying you're thwarted by like the system that requires you to like be a certain way and see a certain number of patients every 15 minutes. And then you get yourself into a situation where something is unfamiliar. I mean, just think of it in that context, something that's unfamiliar to any, anyone is kind of like scary and threatening. And we don't, that's not part of medical training. I mean, we get a little bit, we get, we get a little bit of, you know, coaching on bedside manner, right? Like how to, how to like really make connections with patients and, and how to present in like a, you know, a comforting and caring way. But like, I would argue that's even like less than we focus on nutrition. It's, it's, it's like a concept like, Hey, you know, obviously you need to, you need to know how to be like comforting and caring and how to present that way to people. Um, but now we're just going to have you work 80 hours a week and do overnight call and do all of these things. And you don't know that you're dysregulated that whole time. And, um, yeah. And then it just becomes the norm. That's the other thing. It's like the, the, the culturally accepted norm that, that providers are, <laughs> are overworked and burnt out and, um, and our healthcare system puts us in this position and it's like just how it is, you know? Um, I think that's the, that's probably like the biggest thing is like, we just keep working in a broken system, I think attempts to try to change it are there, but I don't know exactly, you know, big, big, bigger, bigger systems have, have to make bigger change, which requires lots of moving parts. And I think that's part of the problem too. And, and, you know, um, I, I think that changing systems um, is, is complicated. That's why I'm not really very interested in changing systems. We do parallel play. We, 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 we do the thing that we think our patients need and we are, you know, we try to be co-creating an experience and there's definitely trade-offs, um, definitely trade-offs, um, but it's the changing, changing a system is, is daunting. Christina asks, do other countries do better with limiting hours? Um, to, um, you know, I, 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 um, there's a, there's a, a, a group of physicians, um, belong to an organization called Autistic Doctors International. And, um, this is, this is everywhere. This is, this systemic dysfunction is everywhere. And it's, um, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, David says so many practices are being bought up by big systems, right? Yeah. So, so again, when we think about, you know, dysregulation, if you have an access need for autonomy or you had autonomy or agency to make adaptations to meet your own access needs, even if you don't have that language or that framework for understanding that's what you're doing, and then it's taken from you. And um, that's really hard. Um, and I think that, you know, in outside of healthcare, I think many people have had the experience of, you don't know what something is what role something is contributing in your life until it's gone and you're like oh i guess that thing was doing something that that thing or that practice or that habit or that you know that accommodation or like whatever it was and you're like oh i didn't know i needed that because most people don't grow up talking about their needs um it's like the um i, I often quote my patient who said i don't know what my needs are i just know they're not met He's commenting, I like the parallel play metaphor, not change the system, but create a parallel system, right? Yeah, it's, um, I have an access need for self-efficacy and um, the, the idea of that it's actually not in a small, in a small little microcosm, 
um, you can actually do the things you're trying to do for people, with people. But large systems, large systems have so many more barriers and so many more opportunities for thwarting access needs. Well, and it also, I mean, I think it, um, it also depends. I mean, what, what seems to happen with large systems is that oftentimes large systems, the, 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 the primary focus of the large system is how do we keep the large system going, which is a different question than how do we continue to, how do we respond to the, the evolving needs of the, the population we're serving in the moment. And so if the large systems were asking that question, then the, then maybe they would be evolving in a different way. But I think, but but so much of the time, the large systems are like, how do we not, how do we continue to be a large system and grow our system? And that's, and when that's your question, it's not that, that and that's your top priority. You, you, what, you know, however you meet patient needs is secondary and, or however you meet your service population needs is secondary to be, to be coming and sustaining your large system. And, and I think that's a real difference that um, and and often with the value of small systems is they start out with like they're they're free to start out with we we're, we're we're addressing this issue this is our concern and what are, and how and and we want to and we're studying the concern and we want to respond be responsive to the concern. Thank you, Sarah. And I think two things come to mind based on what you just said. So one is, I mean, isn't that the case with with all systems of power? Um, that power is perpetuated. Person, the person, the system, the entity that has more power stays in power without doing some the 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 hard work of of shifting that. Um, and then the second thing that I might I might add is that like it is it is um like the looming threat of like recreating something that doesn't work um, is, 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 is also real. Um, and so, you know, shifting from, you know, and I think, I, 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 I think here at Auburn's belong, you know, the conversation starting to be had around, well, how are we really ensuring that we are having the impact that we are serving the people in a way that they would define as successful, not how we would define as successful. And that's, that takes some intentionality to it, but like that's that's what has to be done. Otherwise, um, you know, like I I uh, I have I have I have a a mentor, a, a, so I've got a business career, who you know is trying to teach me about like the history of like evolution of businesses and the different phases things go from. Like I don't want that for that. Um, I had a big PDA response to my history lesson. Um, uh, so, so, you know, it's just that, um, David's saying, yes, yeah, systems exist to perpetuate themselves and grow, right? There's very little to be done about that parallel systems. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. And, uh, Kat says after one visit, I got five separate bills, right? So, you know, it's, it's, um, that a big system is complex in that way. And, um, I think that, what could be done a lot better is transparency, right? So if, so some of these like, you know, these stories of like, oh, I got, you know, these five bills from these five different components. And so if, how on earth would anyone have a framework for understanding that when that's not what you do, that's not your world. And so transparency ahead of time of this is what you can expect. And it might look and sound ridiculous, but this is what it is. And then you can decide, you can have informed consent about whether you want to interact with that. Um, th I think that's another really important component um, of, of, of shifting away. Of, 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 it's, it's a component that drives 
dysfunction when you don't have transparency. And it's not because, and, and, and that's a systems problem. I don't think that's an individual healthcare provider problem. So when we think about, you know, on social media, um, I, I, I often see there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of narrative around, around financial incentives, you know, well, you know, this healthcare provider did this to me because, you know, it puts more money in their pocket. That's narrative is probably not true in 2023. Most of the time, um, uh, most, most healthcare systems are hospital owned system owned system dictated. Most healthcare providers who work for those systems are salaried. Um, so the, it, but, but that narrative persists. And in fact, the system thwarts an individual healthcare provider from even knowing how much something costs. They don't tell you. And I remember as a resident, like a trainee being like, how much does it cost to order this lab test? And my supervisor would be like, we don't know. Like, don't like, how do you find out? And they're like, I don't know. And I remember like how hard it was to try to find that out. And turns out the amount that a test, a particular, like a particular lab test, not just labs, but like a particular, you know, each of the line items, the things that get checked have their own cost. And so um, the individual like price tag of an individual lab test differs depending on what your insurance situation is. Um, it's just a nightmare. So there are systemic barriers even to transparency and transparency of course is the way out of chaos. Uh, Steve says um, systems in the best sense compel people to change their behavior. There's a lot of resistance to that kind of system. Big difference between a system, a, a system versus the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that um, one of the things that that Dr. Warzella included in her panel comments last week was just talking about um, the system often stigmatizes even people who within it, who dissent. And that is, that's a common theme as well. And I don't think that's unique to healthcare. I think that like, you know, the, the problem child, the, you know, the, 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 the instigator, the, you know, um, the agitator, you know, that role who questions and demands better um, and points out dysfunction, that person is often pathologized and thwarted and often ousted when conflicting access need situations arise. Um, and so just understanding that as a, as a framework, I think explains a lot of interpersonal and like institutional conflict because it's common. Speaking of which, um, next week, uh, we will be, oh, sorry, Aaron's saying descent being pathologized. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that, that, this is, this is what goes on. And this is, you know, um, when we think about the poor healthcare outcomes for neurodivergent people, barriers to healthcare access is, is one, um, inadequate knowledge from within the healthcare system of the needs of neurodivergent people. That's another, but what about everyday life, all of the thwarting that goes on that contributes to an autonomic nervous system that is dysregulated, drives people into neurodivergent burnout, et cetera, which is the topic for next week's Brain Club. We're going to be joined by Annie Crow, who is a human rights attorney from Australia um, and a disability advocate. And we are going to be discussing um, uh, she and I are going to be uh, 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 presenting on autistic burnout and employment and the relationship of burnout, employment related aspects to burnout and the impact on health. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for coming and thank you again so much to our panelists. Bye, everybody.